You have chosen a path up to this point. If you keep walking the path that you're walking, where will it lead you? Will it lead you where you really want to go? Where you thought you were going to be by this time in your life? So it's so very important you listen carefully because Jesus just cut it down. There are only two. Today on In Touch, The Two Paths of Life. The choices you and I make today determine our tomorrows. That's why we have to be careful what kind of choices we make in life. For some people, they make very, very important choices carelessly. They somehow don't look beyond today and they don't look beyond tomorrow. They don't look beyond the future, realizing there are always consequences to decisions we make. Would you not agree that probably all of us have made decisions we wish we could remake? That there are decisions made that we probably regret? If we knew what the consequences were, we would never have made that decision. If we knew where it was going to lead us, we would never make that decision. So how, how, do, you, how do you make those choices in a way? Do you make those choices on the basis of your, the influence of others, for example? You make those choices on the basis of money or your health or what, what is it? So maybe the opportunity? Where, where does the will of God fit into how you make choices in life? And I say again, it's so very important because we live with them. In fact, we've made choices of what uh, road are we going to travel in life? And the truth is the path you're living today is the path upon which you have chosen to walk out your life. You started back yonder a long time ago, and you've been on this path so long. Uh, did you d make a decision? Well, that's how I want my life to work out. That's the path I want to live in. That's what Jesus said. Or did you just sort of find yourself drifting into it? Well, Jesus is crystal clear about the kind of path we should walk on. And he is very clear when it comes to making contrast, to make it so clear so we know exactly what we can expect. So I want you to turn to the Sermon on the Mount, five, six, and seven chapters of the book of Matthew. And once in a while you'll find some of your friends who will say, now, I don't believe all the Bible, but I believe the Sermon on the Mount. Well, what that tells you is that they haven't read it. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in the seventh chapter, uh, just a couple of verses I want us to read here, and I want us to explain them before we uh, get into uh, a further message. But look at, if you will, the 13th verse of the seventh chapter. He says, and the word he uses enter here is a command. He commands us, enter through the narrow gate. Now watch this through the narrow gate. Now skip down to the 14th verse where it says the gate. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. For, for, go back now. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. So we're talking about two different gates here. And you have to skip down to see which one he's talking about. So enter the narrow gate. Uh, this gate the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then back again now. Enter through the narrow gate, then we change the gates, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad, and it leads to destruction, and there are many people who enter through it. So what Jesus is simply saying is this. There are only two ways to live. That is, we walk the path of righteousness, walk the path that's godly, or we walk the path that's full of destruction and ruin in a person's life. And if you'll think about it, all of us have chosen a path. And the path that you and I are living on today is the path that we've chosen. Now, you may not have sat down and said, this is the path I'm going to choose, but you chose one. You may have found yourself maybe influenced in that way, or somebody convinced you and persuaded you, or whatever the situation, you're walking on the path that you've chosen. Now the question is this, where is it going to lead you? If you keep walking the path that you're following, where are you going to end up? You say, well, I don't know. Don't you think it'd be wise before you chose a pathway in life to ask yourself the question, where will this lead me? What will this get me? How will I end up? What's the, what's the final stage of my life? Where am I going to spend eternity? 
you should ask them very sobering questions. And if you're on a path today that you wish you were not on, I'll show you how to get off of it. If you're on a path and don't know why you started it, maybe you'll find out today. The important thing is this. You're walking on a path. You've chosen that path. It has consequences, good or bad, depends on which path it is. And I want you to listen carefully to this message. It's interesting in this passage, for example, if you keep going, you'll, t you'll notice he talks about good trees, bad trees. He talks about um, the fruit and so forth, and talks about uh, good foundations and bad foundations. So when you look at all this, listen to what he says. He talks about two gates, narrow and wide, two ways, narrow and broad, two destinations, life and destruction, two groups, few and many. Two kinds of trees, good and bad. Two kinds of people who profess faith in Christ, the sincere and the false. Two kinds of builders, wise and foolish. Two kinds of foundations, rock and sand. And two kinds of houses, secure and insecure. And you'll see that Jesus makes it very, very clear. Two choices, that's it. I have two choices in life. So you have chosen a path up to this point. If you keep walking the path that you're walking, where will it lead you? Will it lead you where you really want to go? Where you thought you were going to be by this time in your life? So it's so very important you listen carefully because Jesus just cut it down. There are only two. There's a path of righteousness, godliness. There's a path of, that leads to destruction and a path that leads to eternal life. You say, well, I decide to, uh, I'm just going to go along on this path and change my mind out there somewhere. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Very important you listen carefully. So let's look at this first path, and uh, he calls it the broad way. So when you look at that, uh, he talks about the wide gate. Now what is he talking about? He's talking about that lifestyle and that pathway. If you choose that wide, then uh, you can have all kind of diversities of beliefs. You can believe most anything in the world you want to believe, all kind of philosophies and opinions, and people have all kind of religions, and, and everything seems to be fine, and you have your religion, I have mine. But on the path we walk, we don't criticize each other. We choose what we believe in life. Uh, we don't uh, talk about Jesus necessarily or the Bible. We just enjoy life and move on on the broad path. And it's a place of freedom, and we don't worry about consequences. That's the broad, wide path. This is a path, he says, that's crowded. And that is, he said, many are in this path. And if you look around you, for example, today, as a follower of Jesus, in some circles you find yourself in, you have to look for the believer. You have to find the Christian. There was a time when most people in this country believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, believed the Word of God. That's no longer true. There are many people in this country who do not even know who Jesus is. You'd be surprised the people, when you talk about Jesus, they'd say, and I was uh, talking to someone the other day, and I said, do you have a Bible? I, if I'd have been a bet man, I'd have bet sure he had one or two or three Bibles. And at this point in his life, he said no. Listen, this is no longer the Christian nation it used to be. Jesus and the Word of God and the Christian does not have the place we used to have. And what, mean, what that means is that people have stopped listening to the Word of God. They have decided to walk a certain way, and that crowd's getting larger and larger all the time. They want to be able to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, as they want to do it. And uh, they think in their crowd they're the strongest, and on and on they go. That's the broad way. The broad way is ungodly. It's undisciplined. It, uh, it allows all kind of things. You can drink all you want to drink, gamble all you want to gamble. You have all kind of sexual immorality. You can have it your way. That is, uh, in other words, this, they, they call this the, the free way. It is not the free way. Jesus called it the way of destruction. But people today want freedom. They say, I want freedom to do what I want to do, go where I want to go. I don't want anybody telling me what I can do and what I can't do. Fine, that's, that's the path. That's the crowded path. That's, that's the broad way. That's the way of the ungodly. And so if that's what you want, you can have it. And Jesus is not going to say to you, no, you can't do that. 
If you want to live a life that will end in destruction, you want to live a path, walk a path where you've got freedom to do what you please, you tell your parents to forget it, you know what, uh, you're at this point in your life and they've raised you and now you are free to do what you want to do. You can have all kind of sexual affairs you want to have, drink all you want to drink, live like you want to live, party like you want to party, and all the rest and say, well, that, that's the path I choose. I just want to warn you. That path will lead you ultimately to being eternally separated from God. And the Bible calls the place H-E-L-L, hell. I know you don't like to hear it. You don't want to hear it. That's not what you want to hear. I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm here to tell you what Jesus said. And it depends on where you want to end up in life. And it depends on what rules you want to live by. Maybe you don't want to live by any rules. You don't want anybody telling you how to live your life. You have enough money enough property, enough this, enough friends, and all the rest. You can get anything in the world you want. But the one thing I know you don't have is you don't have any peace, any real joy. You have absolutely no security whatsoever. You could lose everything you have in a split second. You have no assurance. You, ha you have nothing that you can be confident about. So you're living on a path that is a path of destruction. You're living on a path that Satan walks, and he encourages others to walk the same path. The path of freedom, the path of liberty. Now you can do what you want to do, when you want to do it. It's nobody else's business but yours. Yes, there is. You cannot live apart from the knowledge of Almighty God. He knows where you're headed, why you're headed there, and he will do his best to keep you off that path, change paths. But if you insist on living that kind of life, you will end up with the consequences that that pathway provides. Then I think it, it, it's the way of darkness. Now you see, uh, if you'll think about it for a moment, uh, go back to Proverbs chapter uh, 4 for a moment, and uh, let's look, if you will, in the 19th verse. Because you see, if, if you'll think about this, isn't it interesting that bars and places like that, and I guess nightclubs haven't been in any, but the way the world operates, isn't it interesting that they cut the lights down real low, <laughs> that it's real dark? You know what? That's scriptural. Listen to this. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They're walking in darkness because they have shut Christ out of their life. And when you shut Christ out of your life, uh, you, you've got a major problem. So look, if you will, on to John, that same, John 3.16. This is the same chapter of John 3.16. People say, well, I believe in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. We're coming back to belief for a moment. But listen to what in the same chapter people say, I believe Jesus said that. Well, let me tell you something else Jesus said. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, speaking of himself. And men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. And this is just the clear teaching of the Word of God. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Now watch this. And he says, now when he leaves, you and I are the light of the world. So that our life is to be a light in the darkened world, a darkened community, wherever you live, a darkened household. You can be a child of God in the household and everybody else in there is lost. He says, when he left, we're the light. And he says, the unbelieving world hates the light. And I was listening to this atheist on television the other day, and he was being interviewed, and I thought to myself, I felt sorry for him, because he couldn't answer any question, what do you believe? Well... You know what? If, if, if you're an atheist, what do you believe? Well, I, I don't believe I ought to have my rights. Well, you have all the rights you want. But what's going to happen when you die? You don't believe in God? Wait till you get there. And wait till you start breathing your last breaths. You're going to want somebody to tell you the truth and tell it to you fast. All the stuff that you and I hear, we don't believe in Jesus, we don't believe in the Bible, and now, for example, I hear there are atheist churches. So I'm going to say, what are y'all saying? What do you talk about? Who's the leader? What hope do you have? What assurance do you have? What's your purpose? In other words, just getting together to do what? And so Jesus said it's very clear. There are only two paths, and no matter how you 
how you classify one path or how you decorate it. You can't decorate it to the point that God accepts the pathway of the wicked. He does not. And it's, it's also a way of disappointment. You can't tell me that anybody is living in sin, in absolute disobedience to God, and who's happy and contented because it is absolutely a contradiction of emotions. You cannot live in ungodliness. You cannot live in deliberate, willful sin, knowing that you're sinning. And you can say, well, I don't believe it's a sin. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know the Bible says it's a sin. Yes, you do know it's a sin. You're trying to convince yourself it's not. Listen, you're trying to change God's mind about what He absolutely, totally, completely condemns. You're not going to change the mind of God about that. He hates sin. That doesn't hate the sinner, but he hates sin because of what it does to his children. He hates sin because of what it's doing to you on the path that you have chosen. That path, the Bible says, he says it's the path that leads to, listen, not only disappointment, it's the pathway that leads to destruction. And he asks a question in Mark, the eighth chapter. Look at that for just a moment. The eighth chapter of Mark, beginning in verse 34. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, look at this, if anyone wishes to come after me, as to follow him, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Listen, to become a believer is more than just saying, I believe in Jesus. You can believe in a lot of things. We have to be clear about what he means about belief. Then he says, and whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. And then he asked this question I want to challenge you to answer. What does it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does it profit a man? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What's the answer to that? Listen to me carefully. And I say this not because I'm being critical, but because I'm being honest and biblical. You are foolish to live out the path that you're walking on in absolute disobedience to God, which he says is a path of destruction, denying the presence of Christ, denying the Word of God, criticizing and persecuting believers, in order to fulfill whatever those desires are in your life, thinking that somehow one of these days it's going to get better. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse because you're going to be more and more captivated. And you're going to be more and more imprisoned by your habits and your sin and your disobedience to God. Jesus never spoke anything but the truth. And what he's doing in this passage is warning us there are only two paths. Not three, but two paths. And he says in this passage that it is a way of destruction, disappointment, darkness. It's the broad way. It's the wide way. It's the way of the ungodly. Then he says there is another path. And, and listen to what he says in this passage now. He says, enter through the narrow gate. And how does he say about that? For this gate is small, and the way is narrow, that leads to life, and there are few who find it. That is, comparatively, there will be few Christians compared to the world's population, few Christians. It is our job to get the truth of the knowledge of Christ to everybody on the face of this globe, and that's what we're attempting to do, and succeeding at it by the grace of God and the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit and many, many missionaries and many, many people who are preaching the gospel in every language possible all over the world. But we'll always be outnumbered. And what he's simply saying here is this. This narrow way is just that. It is the narrow way. And that is, in the narrow way, you don't have a mixture. Well, a little bit of this religion, a little bit of that religion. Or a little bit of this is okay, and a little bit of that's okay. You don't have a mixture of lifestyles. You don't have a mixture of uh, attitudes about God, and I believe in this God or that God or the other. This is the way that Jesus calls all of us to follow. And when you see that, he says it's narrow. It requires discipline. If you live a godly life, there's some things you won't allow in your life. 
And I see parents, for example, who are allowing everything imaginable in their life and in their household, and then they get all upset because their kids get on drugs and they get on uh, drinking and sex and everything else. And you want to ask the parents, well, what, what kind of pattern did you set in your home? What kind of language did you talk about? Was every third or fourth word in your, in your family a curse word because you just want to be smart? And I hear people use words that I would not repeat. You, you are misused in the name of Jesus, but He is not a word of profanity. He's the Son of God, the holiest name that there is. So the narrow way, He says it's the way of the few. Jesus said one time to His disciples, Will you two walk away? His crowd got so small, he had just a handful of people following him because they didn't like the idea of discipline and uh, your life, your crucified life on the cross and being obedient to God. And so you think about this. If you want to get a crowd, you appeal to the crowd. What appeals to the crowd? Freedom. Liberty. Have your way. Do it as you please. Uh, everybody enjoy life. Enjoy life for the moment, but that's it. It's so deceptive, and yet the narrow way, he says, it's the way of the few. Few there be that find it. It's the way of wisdom, for example. Go back to Proverbs again, the fourth chapter, and look what he says. The narrow way is the way of wisdom. How do you want to, how do you want to live your life? How do you want to walk it out? You want to walk wisely? The whole book of Proverbs is all about how to live out our life wisely. Listen to this fourth chapter of Proverbs in the tenth verse. He says, Hear my son and accept my sayings. And now watch this. And the years of your life will be many. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. Look at that. This is what God is saying. He says, I've directed you in the way of wisdom, whether you heard it or not, whether you chose it or not, is the path you choose. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. When you, when you walk, your steps will not be impeded or hindered. And if you run, you will, listen, he says, you will not stumble. Take hold of instructions. Do not let go. Guard, listen, guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not proceed in the way of evil men. It can't be any clearer. There's a path of wisdom, righteousness, holiness, godliness. It's a path that's, I didn't say anything about being easy. There's nothing easy about living a godly life. But I'll tell you one thing. When it comes to what our heart desires, our soul cries out for peace and joy and happiness and confidence and assurance and eternal life and true genuine friendships and all the rest, that's the path. Few there be that find it. On the other path, the crowds. You don't see all the lights and all the glamour on the narrow path, but it's the right path, the path of wisdom. And it, it's the path of following Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said. I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Oh! They say, they, that, that's being narrow-minded. It is. It's very narrow-minded. Listen, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Somebody says, well, I don't believe He's the only way. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, if He's not the only way, how you, how, who's going to deal with your sin? You say, well, my sin's not so bad. That's your opinion. A holy God says your sin's evil and wicked and vile in His eyes. What are you going to do with your sin? Well, I'm just going to confess it. Did you know that confessing sin is not what removes the penalty of sin from your life? You say, well, I go to church and confess my sin every week. I'll bet you confess the same thing every week also. Confessing your sin does not remove it. Watch this carefully. When Jesus came to this earth as the virgin-born Son of God, He came sent by the Father. He came sent by the Father for the primary purpose of laying down His life on the cross, shedding His blood as the ultimate final sacrifice. God prophesied all the way back to the beginning of time. He laid down His life on the cross in order for God to be able to forgive you of your sin, He paid your price. The Bible says that God said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
if there's no crucifixion, no shedding of blood, there's no payment for your sin. This is why the cross is so precious to all of us who are believers. We understand what it is. It is the symbol of God's awesome love and payment for the sin of mankind. In order for God to be just, in order for God to be truthful, He had to pay our sin debt Himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, laid down His life on the cross. That satisfied the requirements of God for the penalty of sin. Therefore, when you trust Him as your personal Savior, it's more than just confessing, yeah, I believe in Jesus. When you trust Him as your personal Savior, you're surrendering your life to Him. And you are accepting His forgiveness, not on the basis that you've confessed it. You've, you have accepted His forgiveness on the basis Jesus died and paid the penalty. This is why confess, 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 and you can confess till the day you die, and it's not going to do you a bit of good. Until you're confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, your only hope, and He came as a sacrifice in order for you to be forgiven by Almighty God. And on the basis of that, Jesus Christ being the Son of God, Jesus Christ being God in the flesh for those 33 years He was on the, on the earth. When you trust Him as your Savior, that means you're giving up your old way. You're surrendering your life to Him. That's the narrow path. That's the narrow gate. That's where the few are because most people want to have religion and liberty. They want freedom to do anything they want to do and then go to their God and say, Lord, in Jesus' name, forgive me or whoever they're praying to. So I ask you a question. When you confess your sins to God, do you simply say, Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me in, in Jesus' name or however you say it, Amen. Well, why should He forgive you? In other words, if you, if you just have a guilty feeling and you know you're going to do it again tomorrow, that's not confession. There's no repentance in that. What did Jesus say? He says, he says, except the man be born again. What does that imply? What does that say? There's got to be a change. A new birth is, is a new life. And Paul said, if any man be in Christ, trust in Christ as Savior, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, things have become new. Because now you have Christ living on the inside of you, enabling you, showing you what is right, and giving you the power to live a godly life. There are only two paths. And the path that you're living today will determine what happens tomorrow. And I don't say any of these things to be critical. I'm saying because you need to understand Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will be the one every single one of us stands before, kneels before, stretched up before, whatever, when we stand in the judgment. All the stuff that you hear people tell you, well, it's going to be like this. He says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. There is no escape when you and I stand before Him, if we have been washed in the blood of Jesus, having trusted Him as our Savior, surrendered our life to Him, we're going to be able to stand before Him freely. Only the love of God will be there. If you reject the Son of God, listen, think about this. You reject the only hope you have. You reject the Son of the Almighty God who created this world and its atmospheres and everything around us. You reject Him. Whatever your reason for rejecting Him, you'll stand before God and give an account. And having heard the truth of the gospel, what will you say? Well, you know, I'll tell you, people here, here's what I'm going to say. I'll tell you what you're going to say. Nothing. <laughs> you're not going to say anything. Listen, we don't, any of us know how it's going to be, but when I think about before Jesus, I want to stretch out my face on the floor and bury my nose in the carpet. Just thinking about lying before righteousness, holiness, such glory that Jesus Christ, if, listen, if He hadn't laid aside His glory before He came, no, nobody would have seen Him. Because the radiance of the glory of perfect purity and righteousness is so bright, nobody could have seen Him, nobody could have touched Him, nobody could have felt Him, nobody could have, uh, the eyes would not conceive of it. Sin is sin. Sin is darkness, and this is what he's saying. Sin is darkness. And there are people who say, you know, I just believe somehow that I'm going to get there. And every once in a while, I'll hear people say, um, um, well, 
I, I know I'm not perfect, and, but, but I believe somehow, ultimately, we're all going to get to heaven. Let me just say this to you. There is not one single bit of a reason, let alone Scripture. There is no reason. You mean to tell me you think that you're going to get to heaven with your sin and disobedience and rebellion toward God? That you're living a sinful life? That you're violating the pr one principle after the other, one commandment after the other, and that somehow one of these days we're just going to all get there because God is a God of love. Let me tell you why you're not going to get there. You know why you're not going to get there? Because He is a God of love. If God allowed you to get to heaven, violating His law, violating His principles, if, if, if He let you get by with that, that wouldn't be love. That would be falsehood on the part of God. Everybody is not going to heaven. There's only one way according to the Word of God. And the reason we do our best to get the gospel to the whole world, we want everybody to hear it. We want everybody to know the truth. Somebody says, well, what about those folks who've never heard? I'm always listening to that. Let me say one word. First of all, that's not your problem. Your problem is you've heard it. You hear it. You know it. That's the issue. Don't shift it off to somebody else. And so all this reasoning that goes on, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I want you to listen to what Jesus said. In John 8, 12, Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, look at this. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you're following Jesus, you're not going to walk, you're not going to be walking the broad way. You're going to walk the narrow way, as he says in the scripture here, where the, and he says, few there be that find it. Now, in light of these two ways, the broad and the narrow, how do we explain the carnally minded Christian? Now, what's a carnally minded Christian? A carnally minded Christian is what Paul says, the fleshly. Carnally minded means that, for example, all of us have some bit of naturalness in us. That's why you still have the capacity to sin. A person who's walking in the flesh, a person who's walking in, in, in the naturalness is a person who's doing what their desires call for them to do. And so every single one of us have sinned and ask God to forgive us and cleanse us, and He has. And all of us will sin at some point in our life. Go to Galatians chapter 5. And I've got a couple of passages I want you to look at. And all of us have the capacity to sin against Him. But listen to what Paul says uh, in verse 16 of the fifth chapter. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Be obedient to the Spirit who is within you. And you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. There's never going to be a time when there's no desire within you whatsoever or when the desires are there. For example, you and I can, we can say no to those desires that Satan throws against us and toward us. We have the power to say no. He says, I say to you, walk by the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh, that is that naturalness within us, sets its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please, that is the flesh. So we have the Spirit of God within us to enable us to overcome temptation and being a disobedient to God. Now watch this carefully. A believer is not, you and I may, we, we may sin here, sin there, something, but an, a person who's given themselves over to sin on an ongoing, continuing basis, you say, well, were they saved? Well, I had to ask that question. Okay, let's go back to uh, that passage we read in the beginning, the seventh chapter of uh, Matthew again, and look, if you will, in this um, 20th verse. Back to Matthew 7, verse 20. Now, I'll tell you something interesting. When you, and for, for you who are listening, the wisest thing you could do is to take your Bible with you when you sit down to watch uh, In Touch or when you listen to the radio and a pastor, whoever he may be, gives you a passage of Scripture. Watch this carefully. It's one thing for you to hear it. It's something entirely different for you to see it. Listen to what he says. So then, he says, Here's how you can know the difference between the saved and the unsaved. 
so then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, the Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter the, uh, heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Very religious. Listen, these are all religious things going on. So we cast out demons. We did this. We did the other. And he says, all this in your name, and perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who do what? Practice lawlessness. Practice means to do something on an ongoing to continuing basis. So let me ask you a question. Is there any sin in your life that you have accepted as a way of life, that you practice? It's continually a part of your life. You don't excuse it. You don't confess it anymore. It's just a part of your life, and you've rationalized it, and you've accepted it as a part of your life. I'm telling you, you need to ask yourself the question, have I ever really and truly been saved with the grace of God? Now, let's look at this idea of belief for just a moment. Somebody says, well, I believe in Jesus. What does that mean? That used to bother me when I first got in the ministry. So I took my Greek Bible. I started in Matthew. I went all the way through uh, the New Testament. Every time I found the word belief or believe in the Greek, I translated it to see what it says. Every single time, no exception, to believe is a word of action. If I believe in Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean I had just given mental assent to it. I believe in act. And what is that act? I put my life in His hands. I trust Him. I repent of my sins. I confess my sins. I repent of my sins. I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. You can believe a lot of things. You can believe about this and believe about that and believe somebody says, well, I believe in Him. What does that mean? That you put your trust in Him? Well, it can mean a lot of things. But when you say you believe in Jesus Christ, the New Testament word belief is a word of action. This is why he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And I would ask you, do you really and truly, have you ever really and truly surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom He sent into this world as the only means of satisfying God's requirement for, a, for a paying a penalty for sin? You recall all those sacrifices in the Old Testament? They were, they were foreshadowing the coming of Christ. When He came, it's the final sacrifice. Remember that the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom and opened it all up, the Holy of Holies. Why? Because you and I now have access to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. We don't have to go through anybody. You don't have to go through anybody. Jesus opened the door for you and me to be able to have a personal, intimate relationship with God. But listen to me carefully. When you say you believe in Jesus, you believe what about Jesus? Do you believe that He's the Son of God? If you believe that, you will surrender your life to Him. Do you believe He was just another man? Then that is a belief that brings you nothing but ultimate destruction. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the sacrificial, substitutionary, all-sufficient sacrifice for your sins and my sins. Therefore, if you want to get on the right path, you have to step on the right path by placing your trust in Christ as the crucified Savior, asking God to forgive you of your sins, and surrendering your life to Him to follow Him all the days of your life. And let me tell you something else. You can't straddle the fence on these two pathways. Well, I'm going to walk over here, and then I want to walk over here. No, you can't. There are two paths. You've chosen one already, whichever path that is. You say, well, how do I get off this path? I'll tell you how. If you're willing to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're willing to acknowledge the fact that God sent Him into this world for the purpose of dying on the cross in order to shed His blood, to, to make the payment for your sin and the sin of the world, you willing to believe that Jesus Christ crucified was a sacrificial substitutionary death. In other words, it was for us. You willing to believe that He's the Son of God and the Savior. 
you willing to ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to repent of those sins, to turn away from them by the strength and the help and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You willing to turn away from that. You willing to surrender your life to Him totally and believe in that surrender and that confession that Jesus Christ is forgiving you of your sins. You're accepting that forgiveness and accepting that He has a brand new life for you and you're choosing to walk in that. He takes you right off that old path, puts you on your new path, because now you become a new person in Christ. My friend, believe me, if there were any other way, I would tell you. I, it, I would tell you, if there's any other way, I would tell you. But you have to decide whether you believe the Word of God or you do not. So let me just ask you this. You say, well, you know, there's something about this Bible that bothers me. And uh, so let me ask you this. If, you, if, if, if for some reason the Bible bothers you, if you don't live by this, what are you going to live by? I'll tell you a better question than that. If you don't die by this, what are you going to die by? And where are you going to spend eternity? In Jesus' name. I trust that you'll be wise enough right now, wherever you are, to ask God to forgive you of your sins, forgive you for your unbelief, forgive you for walking the path you've been walking, forgive you for the sin in your life, forgive you for all the excuses you've made and all the attempts you've made to quieten your own stinging conscience and tell him that you're surrendering your life to him and today you want to become a child of God. Right now you can. This is the only way. And the God who wrote this Bible will be the God who judges you and me one of these days. That's why you better stick with the book. Father, how grateful we are for your love for us. I think about how many people, Lord, are traveling a path that's a path of destruction. They have lots of encouragement to keep following that path. But I pray that the gospel of Jesus will so penetrate their hearts they can no longer even live with themselves following in that path. And they'll make the decision to step across to the path that you have for them. It's narrow. Won't be as many people there, but it's the way of eternal life. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Following the path of Jesus Christ requires discipline. Through the strength of the Holy Spirit, believers have the power to say no to sin. At InTouch.org, learn more about God's love for you and the encouragement His Holy Word promises. There you can see today's message, The Two Paths of Life and find a library of free and inspiring messages from Dr. Stanley, sermon notes, and resources to help you achieve victory in times of temptation. Download the InTouch app to take the teaching of Dr. Stanley on the go, or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. The Spirit-filled life is a life lived through us by the Holy Spirit, and the goal is to demonstrate and to express the character of Jesus Christ. An intimate look into the ministry of Dr. Stanley, The Spirit-Filled Life, a new edition of one of his classic books. This biblical perspective on the work of the Holy Spirit can deepen your intimacy with God. Come on, guys, let's go. We're going to be late. Mom, is my homework in my bag? I think so, honey. Bye. Mom, I forgot to take the dog out. That's okay. Love you. Love you. Bye. Have a good one.
we try the drill? I'm with you, buddy. Okay. Life principles to live by. Dr. Charles Stanley's exploration of the 30 foundational truths that continue to guide his life and ministry. Order a box set on CD or DVD at intouch.org. God is not only holy, but He is an awesomely creative God and reveals Himself in different ways. And uh, most Sundays I'll show you a photograph, not every Sunday. And uh, the one I want to show you today, it was so cold. And we were dressed very, very warm. It was so cold, we got back in the vehicles about two or three times, and it rained on us, and we got back in, got back out. And, and uh, we sort of wanted to leave, but I thought, no, we can't leave. Every time I've ever left, I was sorry. So I just said, Lord, help us to be able to stay here. And all of a sudden, this is what we saw. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. And, uh, you know, oftentimes people will leave just before the glory shines. That's why you have to be patient. We be patient with God, patient with ourselves, patient with others, and certainly patient with nature. And so I thought you might like that this morning. And I'll tell you, just encourage me. Oh, <laughs> naturally that does. Because when I'm photographing, I, you can mark this down. I got you in mind. Because I like to show them, not to say, look at me, but to see what God's up to. leading people worldwide into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and strengthening the local church. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is a presentation of In Touch Ministries. This program is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.